Paradoxically, it turns out that we are the United States of America after all. We are deeply united. We're united in our insomnia. Both Republicans and Democrats report problems getting a decent night's sleep. United in our deep fear of the other. Both sides fear that if the other side's candidate wins the presidency, it will be a grave problem for the very future of our republic. We're united, both sides, both united, in being deeply alienated from the sense of national unity. Because however you voted and whoever you voted for, the fact is that half the country voted the other way and feels very strongly about their vote. And we don't get that other half at all. We're united in having a pit in our stomach at all times. We're united in not dealing very well at all with the stress. United in eating too much drinking too much, perseverating too much. The United States of America, united in being divided, united in a very deep 50-50 split. And in this season of division, I want to just raise a single question this morning. For anyone listening to this sermon, here's the single question. What can I do? What can I do now? What can I do personally to make this grim situation a little bit less grim? a little bit better. Now, we all know that there are things that we cannot change. We cannot change the fundamental fact that our nation is divided. That just is. We cannot change the fundamental fact that we are a 50-50 deep split. That just is. What can we change? And here, I think the Torah has some very deep wisdom for us, comes in the form of the two different names by which the Jewish people are known, and both names say something very important to us in this moment. One name by which the Jewish people are known is Israel, and of course you know the story for that, Jacob is assailed in the middle of the night by this mysterious being, and when the mysterious being wants to leave, Jacob won't let him go unless he first gives Jacob a blessing. And the blessing is, no more shall you be known as Jacob, you shall be known as Israel. Because you have wrestled. You've wrestled with beings that are human and divine, and you have prevailed. We are Israel, the people that wrestles. We wrestle with God, and we wrestle with one another. I want to talk about a particular kind of wrestling that this moment calls forth if we're to make the situation a little bit better. And the kind of wrestling I'm going to talk about sounds obviously right. It seems like it's common sense, but it's very much not common practice. It's very hard to do. And this is the wrestling that's required. It is simply this. Not to think that the person who voted for the other candidate is a bad person. Let me say that again. Here's the wrestling. Not to think that the person who voted for the other candidate is a bad person. Not to think that if the other person voted for the other candidate, you obviously have nothing in common with them and their vote means you guess you never really understood them, and 
It's a relationship breaker. I recently got an email from a person whose bar or bat mitzvah I did some 20 years ago. Uh, I'll say bar or bat mitzvah because I'm going to try to make this as anonymous as possible. And this person writes that they're still single and they're looking for a partner and writes that the dating app world is absolutely brutal. And so this person says, by any chance, do I happen to know anybody's adult child or anybody's adult grandchild that this person could date? And this person writes that I can work with anybody. I'll date anybody. They could be rich or poor. They could be super accomplished or just trying to figure out their career. They could be tall. They could be short. They could be Jewishly engaged or completely Jewishly disconnected. There's only one thing this person cannot be. This person cannot support the other candidate. If this person supports the other candidate, then obviously we have nothing in common and it's not even worth going on a date. Now that email is just so real because the animosity for the other candidate is so deep. The animosity for the party that supports that other candidate is so deep that you might think that if they vote for the other candidate, we have nothing in common. Why even bother going out on a date? And that's the wrestling that we have to do. To not think that way. That's the wrestling we have to do. To remember that that person's humanity is bigger than their vote. Now, how do we get there? How do we do that wrestling that we really internalize that the other person's vote for the other candidate does not mean that they're a bad person? Now, one move might be, and I've heard this said by good authorities, Radical listening. Amicha Goodman talked about this in the Hartman Lectures. Radical listening, you listen with curiosity, you listen with sympathy, you listen with an open mind, you listen without judgment to the other person's thinking. So I want to say it sounds good, I'm against that idea. And I'm against that idea for two reasons. Number one, it's very unpleasant. Number two, it does not work. There are no new ideas here. There are no new insights here. There are no new arguments here. It's not like you'd hear something or that either side would hear something and they'd say, oh my God, I never realized. Now my thinking changes. That never happens. People are so dug in. The only thing that that kind of conversation accomplishes is a residue. It deepens the ill will. So how then do we wrestle our way to come to the conclusion that you voted for the other side, but that does not make you a bad person? And here's what I'd like to ask you to deeply, deeply, deeply think about and internalize. Can you say, can you say, we strongly disagree and I love you anyway. Can you say we strongly disagree and I love you anyway? Can you feel in your kishka we strongly disagree and I love you anyway? Can you act on that? We strongly disagree and I love you anyway. The morning after the election, there was this op-ed piece written by a woman named Janine Interlandi. It was in the Times. And she writes that she has a twin brother. A twin brother. They were together in utero. They were together in the same bedroom. 
They were together in childhood. They were together in life. They were together. 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 And now they're far apart. He supports one candidate. She supports another candidate. Total mutual incomprehension. They tried the radical listening thing. They tried the curiosity thing. It got them nowhere. It just deepened the ill will. And Janine Interlandi writes, this is just so real. I'm not sure how we get through this moment. But I don't think it will end when the election is called or when the new year begins or when the next president is sworn in. But I've known for my entire life that I can never truly win anything if it means losing my twin. I don't know where that leaves us. I only know that he is my brother and I love him. So how do we do it? How do we wrestle our way to the realization that we strongly disagree? We couldn't disagree more on the merits, and these are really important issues. And I love you anyway. And that's where the second name of the Jewish people comes so handy. Our second name, one name is Israel, the other name is Judah. So Judah is named for that moment when Leah. Leah is married to Jacob, and all Leah wants is Jacob's love. But alas, Jacob only has eyes for Rachel. Jacob loves Rachel. Jacob does not love Leah. But Leah has the gift of being able to get pregnant and deliver children. And so she has Reuben and Simon and Levi. And she names them each with the hope that now I've given my husband a son, he'll love me. Now I've given my husband two sons, he'll love me. Now I've given my husband three sons, he'll love me, and still Jacob does not love Leah. And finally, her fourth son is born. And this time she names him Judah. And she names him Judah to say, this time I am going to praise God. There is brokenness in the system. I wish it weren't there, but it is. There is brokenness in the system. I wish I could fix it, but I can't. There is brokenness in the system. My husband does not love me, and I get that. And I rue that, and it just is. And it's not going to stop me from praising God, and it's not going to stop me from loving life. Judah, this time I will praise God despite it all. That's what the Jewish people are named for. What is going to enable us to realize that a person is larger than their vote, what's going to enable us to realize that they voted for the other side and we can love them anyway, is this Judah move of trying to focus on what is good, an intentional focus, what is good. I know that there's bad. I know that there's brokenness. I can't fix it. I get it. It is. Now what is good? I'm going to hold on to that good. That's the meaning of the Jewish people's name, Judah. So the day before the election, a woman I've known for 25 years at Temple Emanuel called me. And she called to tell me that she is voting for the other candidate. And she wanted to tell me that. And she said, I want to tell you why I'm voting for that other candidate. And I said, no need to tell me. I'm not entitled to an explanation. I don't want an explanation. You vote your conscience, and that's perfect. No, no, no. I need to tell you. I want to tell you my case for this other candidate. So she lays out the case, and then she concludes by saying, I know you don't agree with that. I hope that's not going to cause a breach in our relationship. And I said to her, I've known you for 25 years. 
you've known all of my colleagues for all those years. You've been a beloved member of the temple for years. You do so much good work at the synagogue and beyond. And you have for years. Your humanity is so much bigger than your vote. I loved you before the election. I'm going to love you after the election. I just couldn't disagree with you more. And I love you anyway. Listen, listen. This is a season of maximal pain, maximally unsettling. We are in month nine of the coronavirus, and it's roaring. A hundred thousand cases a day in this country. We're leading the world in coronavirus cases. And predictably, we're divided, and that doesn't help. And Thanksgiving is coming. And like Pesach that wasn't a real Pesach, a Zoom Seder is not a Seder. Like Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur that were not a real Rosh Hashanah and a real Yom Kippur. A Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur in your couch is not a real Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. This Thanksgiving is not going to be anything like any Thanksgiving that any of us have ever celebrated in our lives before. Which is to say that all of us have already lost so much. All of us have already lost too much. All of us cannot stand to lose anything more. We cannot stand, we cannot bear to lose our relationships too in this season of loss. I don't have the answer to how to ameliorate the national pain. I don't have the answer to how to ameliorate the problem that there are millions of voters throughout our country who see the world so very differently from me. We're just so different, and I don't have the answer to that. But I do know one thing. I do know that the people that I loved before this election, family, friends, the members of our shul, I am going to love after this election. I do know one thing. I will not let this election ruin love. We are united in being divided. We are united in a deep and in mutually incomprehensible 50-50 split. Okay. That just is. Now we've got to get to work figuring out how to love one another anyway. Shabbat Shalom.